tonight. And we're absolutely delighted to be hosted by the Tontine Building. So before we get into the main content, I'd like to ask Simon Smith, who's the brains behind the Tontine and our host for tonight, and hopefully what will be many tech yes, meetups, to just talk about the building that we're in and the reason why the City Council have invested in this space. So, Simon. Thanks very much. Afternoon, evening, everyone. Um, my name is Simon Smith. I'm Economic Development Manager for um, the Council. And my role was to try and deliver a new space that supported businesses past the start-up point, but helped businesses to grow at that point. We recognised the businesses in the city often encounter stress. They have wobbles every so often. And what we want to do is ensure that we've got the correct support for those businesses. And often it's always been the point that we supported startups and we supported businesses when they achieved a significant growth. But we tended not to support the businesses in between. And that is where we actually see that the city encounters the stress points. So that the businesses that choose to locate and work from the city actually encounter the stress as they're starting that early growth. And what we want to do is to ensure that there's a space and a service that tries to complement their needs and reflects what their, their aspirations in growing. So three months ago, this space had plants growing out of it. None of the windows were in place. There was no carpets, it was bright yellow, and it looked like um, a scene from Taggart. Um, <laughs> we were given £1.67 million by Business Innovation and Skills to bring a building back online and deliver a space that businesses could move into and they could operate from. We were given the funding in December and we were told to be complete by March. So we've thrown a lot of resources at it and we've thrown a lot of effort at trying to create a space that we think reflects some of the aspirations of the businesses. One of the things is that you won't see it branded up as a city council, a local authority building. Hopefully it's a building that people could come in, make their own and actually build a community in. And that's, the, that's our main aspiration, that this space becomes a businesses space. So what we've got is we've got desks out there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and um, and then we're about to open up another wing as well. So the space will be open in July for businesses, um, and then we expect to grow and grow. And we've got five years worth of funding. So the total funding pot for this is five point two million pounds. So that's a considerable investment for a local authority to put in place. We've got capital funding, as I say, for one point six seven from the UK government. And that just shows our intention to support businesses as they grow. We want businesses to thrive in Glasgow. We want them to stay in the city and we want them to grow in the city. So that's why this space is so important for us. Um, afterwards, I'm more than happy if people want to have we wander around and show them some of the facilities after all the speeches and presentations. Equally, if there's anything you want to ask us, then um, if you email hello at tontineglasgow.co.uk and someone will pick up and get back to you. And ideally, over the next couple of years and months, it'd be great to welcome some of you in this space. So this is a sneak peek. It's not open to the public yet. So thank you very much for coming in. And hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, we've probably put a lot of pressure on Simon and his team to be the data lab. Uh, and I'm going to be your first speaker tonight quite short and sharp, really introducing the programme. And we've got three fantastic speakers who are going to take us through various topics as we move through this evening. But this evening and the Data Science Tech Meetup is all about networking. So really to maximise the value to you, it's about the networking. As I said earlier, we hope that this is the first of many. And we're looking for volunteers from this audience to speak at future events. We're looking for topics that you'd like to see. Uh, going forward and we'll go and find the speakers and we'll bring them to Glasgow and put them on. So please engage with the community. We've been running the data science tech meetups in Edinburgh for the last year. Uh, we've launched in Aberdeen. This is our launch in Glasgow. We're launching in Dundee and Inverness after the summer and we're now up to a community of over a thousand data enthusiasts in Scotland, which is absolutely fantastic. So you're part of a growing crowd, so welcome. Um, so some of you may well be uh, aware of the Data Lab and its mission, uh, others may not, some around the audience have engaged with us extensively, but essentially we're an innovation centre and really we're there to help Scottish businesses leverage the value of data science and analytics. Okay.
sectors and certain focus areas of which we are one to innovate and to drive economic and social benefit for Scotland and to enable the creation of high value jobs. And Neil, our chair, who's in the front row, so I'm just pointing him out in case he decides to heckle or throw things, um, envisaged the data lab a few years ago and it was in the back, I guess, of, of some of these comments about the value of data the inventor of the internet and the web. Um, but it's the last one I particularly like, you know, in God we trust, all others must bring their data. And actually, more and more businesses are relying on data to help drive their decisions. And actually, I'm sure many of you in the room are participants in that, helping your senior business leaders, helping your boards drive business decisions based on the data that you have and the data that you are collecting, gathering and uh, analysing. <coughs> And just a few examples from around the world. We've now been uh, really active for the last probably 12 to 18 months. We've worked with Scottish Development International. And uh, the reason my head of data is not here tonight is he was presenting at Strata Hadoop in London. So we've gathered some fantastic stories of how companies around the world are using data. And I'll just pick a couple of these before we move into how Netflix users in the, in the audience. House of Cards fans. Yet. There's 10, and each were customised, and you were shown the trailer that matched your viewing habits. So if you were a Kevin Spacey fan, you would have seen a trailer with Kevin Spacey. If you were a fan of the director, you would have seen a trailer that particularly characterised his directing qualities. And Netflix consider themselves a data-driven business. So that's just one example you may not have been aware of, but you probably saw a different uh, trailer to the person sitting next to you. The New York Times, the team, along with eight Scottish companies, visited the New York Times uh, new data journalism team, uh, and they were really impressed by some of the fantastic visualizations they're using about how the users navigate through their site. And they're seeing really different insights by visualizing the data in a different way than tables and uh, graphs and pie charts in the traditional way in dashboards. Actually, they're watching the patterns of how their users move through their site. Jaguar, they're working with a vision analyst who is essentially a psychologist who are analyzing show and sense when you might be becoming like maybe a little bit more aggressive in how you're driving, do you tense your muscles? Yeah, have you got some really aggressive music on? Well, it's, it then might suggest a different driving route, a more scenic route, calm you down. It might suggest changing the radio station. Yeah. <laughs> so that's just a couple of examples. There's fantastic examples from the bobsleigh team and many, many of the other sports. And we've had great engagement from Dr. Malcolm Fairweather from Sports Scotland. And we're working on a couple of really interesting projects just now with the curling team and the swimming team and how they're using data in a way to help drive elite sports performance. But back to the UK. So this is an updated report from the Centre of Economic and Business Review about the impact of data and IoT for the UK economy. And the headline figure is they believe between 20 and 20 22 billion to the UK economy. Scotland's portion of that is just under 40 billion based on the metrics and multipliers that they use. That is huge. It's a huge opportunity for some of the businesses in this room and the businesses across Scotland. But we need to be able to embrace it to actually maximise. I want more than that 40 billion. Yeah. So for Scotland. And um, massive GDP growth potential in this space. And that's from a whole variety of new uses of IoT and data, whether it be business efficiency and optimization, new products, new capabilities and new services. And you might hear a couple of those examples from the rest of our speakers tonight. And as I said, the Data Lab is one of eight innovation centers in Scotland. We are funded through the Scottish Funding Council. And part of our mission is to drive up, help companies drive up the value that they can get from data science. Essentially, we do that through three enablement factors, um, collaborative innovation projects, where we work with our data scientists and academics 
to work on particular industry challenges. We have an extensive skills and talent programme because it's great creating all this demand, but if you can't actually recruit the talent that you need to exploit this going forward, then we're going to fail before we start. And community building, and guess what? This is part of that activity. There are in either a sector or a very niche part of the Scottish economy. So we have Scottish aquaculture, uh, construction Scotland, oil and gas, industrial biotechnology, stratified medicine. They're doing a lot of genome analytics for customised and personalised medicine, digital health and care institute. And the two cross-industry innovation centres are ourselves who focus on data and census who focused on sensors and imaging systems. And we work closely with our colleagues across, of the, across the innovation centres on joint projects where it's relevant for the partners that we're supporting. Part of our role is really joining the research calibre of our academics across the universities in Scotland. And we punch well above our weight in terms of the calibre of that talent. And actually, one of our roles is how do we tap into that for businesses to leverage that capability? bringing industry together and obviously the core capability both technically and strategically from data science. And as I said, we do that through collaborative innovation projects and I've just got some examples of some of the accounts and industry partners we've supported along the bottom here. And we can invest in projects, we can pay for our own time or academics time to help you solve particularly innovative challenges using data science. We have sponsored MSCs, uh, we have co-sponsored PhDs and NGDs, which we've just launched with St Andrews, where we fund 50% of the student for the course of the four years, but they spend 75% of their time in industry working on real problems. So a really valuable way to get cost-effective access to some fantastic talent. We have launched the Data Science Bootcamp, so for anyone who'd like more information on that, come and see us afterwards. But three weeks intensive course in September in Edinburgh, and we've partnered with the Data Incubator from New York, who are covering machine learning, data uh, visualisation and verbalisation, and Python. And they're one of the top educators, if not the top educator in the US on data science. And we have workshops, conferences, CTO away days, data science meetups, and we take Scottish companies in conjunction with our partners at SDI to relevant international conferences. And as I said, you're going to hear from two of the companies that we've supported here today. So I won't go into any of the detail, but if you're particularly interested in uh, any of the projects that we're working on, come and see us afterwards. So that's me. So it's a short, quick... As I said, this is hopefully the first of many. Um, delighted to have you here. So I'm going to now introduce Callum. He's just coming down. Callum Murray is the founder and chief exec of Amicus, a company we've been working with for the last nine months or so, and uh, delighted to have you on board. Thanks very much. Thanks. I'll just... Well, I was, uh, before we start, I was really glad to see Gillian's slide that named uh, various high important people talking about the value of data and the importance it would tie in, given that the strap line is bringing value from data. Um, but when I was asked to do this, normally I do presentations for investors or a startup type conference. So this is actually what I'm much more interested in this than talking about metrics and talking about other things that I don't really think matter as much as the data. So for me, disruption is really subjective. Uh, lots of people say different things about disruption, especially in startup sphere, Airbnb for goldfish, or it could be lots of Steve Jobs quotes. Uh, I don't tend to buy into that as much. I think of it more as a change in culture. Um, and it's complex, simple, or making something that's expensive and inaccessible and making that accessible. So the values behind um, improving access to justice essentially sit behind everything that we're doing. And it happens that data is a really big, important part of that. So why innovate or why disrupt? In our circumstance, as I touched on, justice and access to the information isn't readily available. In 2016, you've got the right to be able to access the information that you need, which to me was quite bizarre. Um, it's, this is really driven by user need. Um, originally, I had a previous company 
um, which died as a result of uh, litigation. So went through the process. I didn't fully understand how complex, how expensive, and how elongated the process was going to be. Um, and in doing so, I realized that the access to the information that you wanted, although it is covered by um, a wide range of different charities and support agencies, it's quite disparate. It's not really joined up. And there's not any real analysis available um, for an SME or a consumer. So in Scotland today, um, as Gillian touched on as well, there's lots of different support agencies. Uh, there's lots of funding available um, and lots of data scientists. This is a, a growing sector, so for us, um, it was a no-brainer. Um, earlier in the week, I was in The Hague and had a chat with the Attorney General from Botswana, who couldn't believe that Scotland was able to do something like the project that we were running and showed that they were really interested in looking at us as a pilot project. So once we've proven our concept here, following the end of uh, the data lab, we've got opportunities to build lots of other areas where this exists. It's a commonality across the globe. <coughs> so this guy, he's instead of Steve Jobs, Dr. Alexander, he's got two, over 200 distinct, major distinctions to his name. He's got 23 patents granted, and he won a Hertz Doctoral Award for his thesis on machine learning and neuromorphic computing. And he agrees that actually the data is the most important thing. Um, Technology is good, that's interesting and enabling, but the data that sits underneath it is actually the most important aspect, um, which we agree with. This is a concept that I really buy into is the idea of data as infrastructure. It's sometimes thought of as oil, it might need uh, to help a system operate, but the way I think of it is more as fundamental, like the pretty much beneath everything in our society, the data that sits there is fundamental. So you need to have joined up roads, you need to have linked data. Previously, 10, 15 years ago, you might have had CompuServe, um, AOL, and they'd have blocks of access to their own kind of paywalls of kind of gardens of data. Now you might see something similar with uh, Google or you'd find other examples where there's chunks of data but they're not widely accessible outside of, say, Facebook. Um, so for us, the idea of making legal data open and accessible to everyone is pretty much key to everything we do. So the idea of open data, again, that's something that came from Tim Berners-Lee's set the Open Data Institute. So we're supported by them as well as the uh, Data Lab in Scotland. And the idea here being that it's not so much about the size of the data, whether it's small, medium, or big, whether the government has it or whether it's personal. The idea is how that can uh, help innovation and open innovation can drive the economy and huge benefits for everyone. So in this example, right across the data spectrum, closed, shared, and open, you've got internal sets of data, driving licenses, something that might be uh, only accessible internally. Um, medical research is an interesting one, given that DeepMind recently accessed 1.6 million records of personal information, which you could argue is for a good cause to try and help uh, reduce incidences of cancer or look at medical reasons. However, was there informed consent? How, how should that, that have worked? How, we'll see how it all plays out. Um, then similarly, as you get more to a public access, looking at the Twitter feed and external data sources that people can mine, but still, um, Twitter's got a lot of hold of that, so it's not really that open. So the value that's actually tied up in this, um, one example was TfL with their opening up of some of their data, they got a 75 to 1% return um, with the CityMapper product. Um, another was reported by Cap Gemini. EU data sharing by 2020 is going to be worth 1.7 billion of an admin saving between departments. So just between different government departments. I think that's a really interesting point to think of policy. Policy is defined and runs like a startup. So if you had a new policy in benefits or in education, if something was rolled out on a small scale and analyzed on a, a really acute level as an MVP or as an alpha beta launch, and then the, the insights from that could then feed into further <coughs> policy. So you might not get four or five years down to a curriculum change in education. It might be really quick. You learn lots of lessons really quick, and then you can iterate and improve on it. So again, <laughs> improvements for everyone, um, aside from the money side of things. So 
where is the line? Like I, I talked about deep, deep mind probably crossing the line in trust, security, privacy. Um, that's something that we're really aware of as to how much you can open up and like what's going to be accessible. How, how is that? Where do you draw the line? When is it a good thing? When does it become bad? Um, there's competitive advantage to be made, but taking that into account, open APIs, building into the new GDPR regulations which are coming from the data protection side of things. So taking that into mind, sharing nuclear launch codes, but there's a, there's a crossover at some point where the value is made from shared data into open. Um, and in our circumstance, uh, part of the data lab work, we did uh, a cyber essentials program where we got in an external security control. All of our systems and processes before doing anything with any in individual data. Um, so more on to actually Amicus and what we're doing. Um, as I mentioned, data is pretty fundamental. Um, before you start in litigation, the idea is to understand how much it's going to cost, how long is it going to take, where do you even go, like where is the court, how many solicitors are relevant for you, who is the best, um, what chance have you got of success? Um, and the idea being giving someone that information up front before they make a decision to go off and run into litigation. Um, so we did a lot of numbers on this. Um, more recently, I looked at some Scottish government stats, which at the moment are further ahead than uh, the rest of the UK. They're, they're quite tight. Um, and over 56% of individuals or SMEs who had a civil dispute weren't able to resolve it, um, which I thought was quite a large stat to be thinking about. Um, these are more general across the UK. Um, some of the, the policy drivers behind that were changes in consumer legislation. So that's came in. It's not really been addressed. It's not really been looked at. At the same time, we've got a digital justice strategy in both England and Wales and in Scotland. So you would think we were pushing at an open door. However, there's a big monopoly over access to data and legal data. Um, about 10 years ago, there were contracts drawn up, um, which meant on to a third party and you and you're due the quote of money. There's then that data you have to pay to commercial companies who own access to this information. At the same time, there are a couple of charities who own information, one called Bailey, um, who are British and Irish Legal Institute. However, they don't index their data and you're not allowed to scrape it, so therefore it's not really that open. Um, you can go online and look at a piece of legislation or you can look at legislation on legislation.gov. Um, so that was a bit of an issue that we uh, kind of came across. But the work we did with the data lab was very much more based on analysis of uh, the situation before we went off to do any work. So um, as a team, we spend a lot of time uh, planning and looking at what's going to happen before any code's written. So this, this all kind of came up along the way. Um, so what we've actually done is take user-based input um, and then text mine the content match that against open legislation on legislation.gov, pick out the right subject area, and then pick out a uh, part of the legislation that relates to the content. And then after that, using clustering to bring case law towards it. Um, part of that work at the moment is to open up a much broader area of case law. So we're able to tell people what their case looks like before they can then pick a solicitor based on, I'm in Glasgow or I'm in Edinburgh and I've got an employment dispute and how many other employment disputes like mine have came before me, how did they end in tribunal, how long did it take? So that's the, the project that we're working on at the moment. We've got an early prototype um, that operates. Um, it's not public at the moment, um, and we're almost at the end of our data lab project, which we've, we've hit all our key milestones, and um, everything's all worked out well as, as it was supposed to do. Um, and in part of that, when we started to address this part of the problem, we didn't actually have a data scientist on board. Um, the data lab hooked us up with Strathclyde University and we worked with their law school and then brought in also the computer and science department. And in doing that, it was Richard Connor, who's no relation to uh, the other Connor from Skynet. But he's actually a really good data scientist. <laughs> um, but we're not actually looking to remove lawyers from the whole scenario. We do value the face-to-face -face interaction of a solicitor. So there are other people in the States and in Canada who are building similar systems. but really value that interaction between the lawyer. We're not trying to take that away. 
but it's to make that process much more efficient so people can understand what they can and can't afford. Um, this is uh, my final slide, um, which is really interesting. One of the uh, security architects that we're working with um, came up with these principles um, around data. Now, they've got a really big team and a really big budget and a lot of time, um, but what we've done is take the principles that they have um, and then build that into everything that we're doing. So the idea is that fundamentally we're trying to improve access to justice and as part of that we're driven by values as opposed to technology or looking at the latest thing that Ethereum are doing or R3. We do keep an eye on what's happening with Deloitte and Barclays and they're doing lots of experiments but that hype curve at the moment is quite high and where we're at is really looking at a robust product that we can take to market. Um, we don't have huge budgets but what we do have is being applied as best we possibly can. That's me. Thank you very much. I am a data enthusiast, Diane McIntyre from GCMB. I make no apologies at all um, about knowing anything about data science and data science, everything to do with data. But what I can do, I'm a potential client and customer or collaborator for yourselves. Glasgow City Marketing Bureau um, is uh, the destination marketing organisation for Glasgow. We are part of the family of uh, arm's length companies um, from Glasgow City Council. Um, on the back of uh, the Future City Glasgow project, um, we have really grasped um, and aspire to become a data-driven destiny. Government's key sectors. Unfortunately, it's uh, highly unproductive. It's got low productivity, low innovation, um, but we've got increasing comp competition across the globe. So data is an opportunity for us to differentiate um, what we do and make sure that everything that we do is as targeted as possible. What you can see here, though, is that we're awash with data. Everything from hotels to trains to subways to retail to restaurants to lawyers to accountants, they all operate in the visitor economy. So there's a huge opportunity for us um, to unlock some of that, I think it was a 3.2 billion or 32 billion opportunity for the UK. Um, but one of the main challenges that we've got as a tourism sector is this is the data that we're reliant upon. Office of National Statistics, Visit Britain, Visit Scotland. As you can, you may not be able to see here, but this is a sample, a sample size of 1,100, which is the sample that's projecting the growth and the size of our day visitor economy at 20 million visits and nearly a billion pounds worth of expenditure. 1,100 records is what that model is using to tell us and inform us about how we... And we don't own these figures, so it's hard to drill into them. Where are all those visitors coming from in the UK? Where are they? Then Leeds, Birmingham, London, Dublin. So this is one of the big challenges that we've got, but the answers and the opportunities are out there. All the data is out there. I'm just going to take you through the journey that I've been on to try and disrupt um, what's uh, this current pattern. Our mission is to create customers. Our customers are leaving crumbs of data everywhere they go. Whether they've actually got here or whether they're interested in researching uh, Glasgow, they're leaving some form of data. And I'm now looking to reach out to them to understand who our customers are and then get inspirational content to inspire them to get you know, Glasgow in front of mind or tactically to get them to convert, to buy a train ticket, to jump on a plane or to come into Glasgow for a day visit. Our customers are the disruptors. 
They're the ones that are wanting personalization. They're the ones that are closing off ads. They're the ones that don't really care about brands. Um, they're the ones that are many, many platforms. They're not on a DMO's platform. They're on TripAdvisor, they're on Airbnb, they're on Expedia, they're on Skyscanner. So we have been disrupted as a sector. We need to go out there and do different things. We can't do outdoor advertising. We can't do um, press adverts. We're going to have to work very, you know, a lot smarter and start to look at spreadsheets and start to work with data scientists. Because our PR people, our journalists, they don't get this. So you guys need to work with us as a sector. We've got limited, we've got limited and no skills. Ask a tourism business what their Google Analytics say and they'll say we don't have the password. So, um, you know, we really need to empower businesses and give them the, this data, visualize it for them, so it's upfront and it's easy and it's accessible so that they can then do some targeted delivery, do t targeted investment and do what they're good at, either looking after the customer, developing their product or their service. One of the key things that data can do as a destination marketing organization, it can help us differentiate and make a point of difference. It can help us to use our people. The user generated content is more trustworthy. Peer to peer comms, social media is more trustworthy than people make Glasgow telling you. We have got a role, but we should create user generated content. And we should be the storytellers. We are st telling the story of Glasgow and all the wonderful experiences that are in it. That's our job to create that. I just want to give you an example of one of the challenges. Hello and welcome. We are a city of culture, heritage and people with a unique attractions, exciting events, world-class sporting offerings, unrivaled musical heritage and famously warm welcomes. This is the ideal destination to visit and explore. And I won't read the rest, but where do you think that is? Dublin, Dublin oh, good, okay. I was hoping someone would say Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, any others, any advances in Dublin? No, another advance? Do we get it? Newcastle. Newcastle, anyone else? Liverpool, Liverpool. Okay, now the point I'm trying to make here is all of our UK destinations can lay claim to this. So what is the compelling proposition and what is the data and who are the customers that are really interested in Glasgow and that we know at that point in time they're ready to be converted through? The answers are in data. And we need to switch ourselves on because this is fine. We can put this proposition in the marketplace, but there's going to be six different UK destinations all using the same thing. So the smarter that we are in our marketing, the more targeted that we are, we'll hopefully be ahead of the game and be increasingly competitive in the marketplace. These guys are disrupting our sector. Google, Airbnb, Skyscanner, TripAdvisor, just got to accept it and get on with it. I don't, in the same way, um, I don't view that as a challenge. I view that as an opportunity. I'm just going to talk through what we're doing with Data Lab and the journey that we've been on. So we've applied successfully to Data Lab to um, work with Skyscanner. Skyscanner opened their data, their travel insights data. Um, so I'm working with the University of Strathclyde to model um, that data and do some predictive analytics. Don't ask me about machine learning and Microsoft Azure <laughs> or regression analysis or neural networks, I haven't a clue. But Skyscanner have got 200 million records for Glasgow and Edinburgh for searches and referrals. Compare that to 1,100 or 5,000 records of people who are searching. They can know what city they're in, what time they're looking at, what products they're interested, how many's in their group size, what they're going to pay for their ticket. That is gold dust to a destination marketing organization. So hopefully, you know, we've just started this project, but hopefully there'll be some great insights out there that'll help us. As I say, yeah, that's what we've got to do. I'm not <laughs> doing it. Uh, I'm the client, so um, <laughs> these guys will hopefully work with us. But you can see the, 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 the opportunity is, is, is vast. TripAdvisor, so this analysis was given to me during the Commonwealth Games in 2014. So it was telling us that Chinese visitors were very interested in Glasgow. Unfortunately, I didn't get the formal analysis till summer 2015, but TripAdvisor were telling us it. So to put this in context, China visits in 2013 were nowhere. In 2014, they were a second top market in terms of spend. So they weren't even on the radar, but TripAdvisor were telling us a year before it. 
because they have that analysis. They can tell who's looking at it. So we're looking and doing some projects with TripAdvisor at the minute to try and get more Glasgow businesses using their platforms, using Viator, so that we can enrich what that picture is and we can then link up with them. Again, they don't open up their data, but they are working in partnership with us, so they won't give us live data feeds. But these trends and analysis are very, very valuable. Do you not buy that? Sorry, do you not buy that? Just that's them, you know, the Chinese market's alive. Yeah, outbound tourism, they're all coming to the UK. Um, and we anticipated a lot of them are going to London, but they're a multi-city destination. They're coming into London, but then they go into Manchester, Edinburgh, and Glasgow. And they're spending three times the amount of any other market. So there's low numbers of them. There's only 19,000, but they're spending the same amount as the Australian tourists who come in their droves. Airbnb, again, we've got about 1,000 um, hosts in Glasgow. And again, I'm working with uh, guys in San Francisco to get these guys to adopt the brand. People make Glasgow. Their hosts are those that um, look after our tourists. It's a different market. Um, in Edinburgh, they've got 5,000 hosts. We haven't seen any differences in the yields in hotels. Um, so it's a completely different market and it's attracting new consumers to the city. So again, not a rich data um, set or anything that we can do with it because it's not open. Um, but again, in partner with them, we can look to see what we can do with them. More importantly, our own analysis has shown us that we've done this. This is for UK segmentation. So this analysis, you can't quite see it. Up to about 1,000, uh, uh, 1 million uh, visitors warm to Glasgow um, are considering using Airbnb. Now, they might be disrupting the market, but we've got to follow the market because they're coming anyway. Um, so we need to make sure these hosts are top of their game, got the right product knowledge, got the right customer service, and they give the visitors that wow factor so that they then tell their friends. As I say, that peer-to-peer -peer, um, referrals is, is far more powerful than any marketing. As I said, the, the sort of where it started was um, with uh, Open Glasgow and the Future Cities Initiative. We worked with them on a, a proof of concept project. Um, and this was to look at um, events. So, you know, Glasgow uh, does events very, very well. Um, but what we wanted to do was categorise those events and see what impact they had on the city centre. So what we did was use data in our events calendar. We then looked at the footfall uh, sensors and the data from them and uh, from the street cameras, uh, from the traffic lights. We then looked at the footfall in the city centre and crucially, we managed to encourage 10 retailers to share their daily footfall with us. So what we were then able to do is differentiate and show the retailers the difference of what was happening in the city when Rod Stewart was playing and then when Calvin Harris was playing. Or any other event. An event could be closing Queen Street Station. You can see the possible impact, negative or positive, on the visitor economy. So this is something that we are, um, as I say, proof of concept. We're looking to operationalise that, make that business as usual. But the opportunity is in hotel index, restaurant index, transport index, digital marketing index. So I'm currently working, I get daily um, occupancy figures um, from hotels. I'm looking at working with Restaurant Diary to aggregate Glasgow restaurant bookings. Um, Transport Index, SPT and ScotRail are very interested in what we're doing. Um, and obviously digital marketing, we've got you know, an abundance of data there that we can use. And all of this, we're not the beneficiary, GCMB are not the beneficiary. This is all to spark innovation and product development in the marketplace. If we empower businesses and data scientists to to, to innovate. We had a dashboard, very clunky, very manual, that was me. There's an opportunity to get work for you guys to do 2.0 in this and visualize the data that we can access. Um, the next steps for us are to answer these questions. Um, who came here, who's here at the moment, who's going to come, what will they want, and what's our customer journey? And if we can answer some of these and improve these, then we will develop as a destination. Digital transformation, um, you know, smart technology, um, power of social media are all going to be emerging trends for us and it's not going to go away. Crucially, our sector in terms of the Scottish Digital uh, Maturity Index, most of our SMEs in tourism and hospitality, they're in this probably up to tentative techies. We need to get them down that maturity index and start to use digital and embed it and transform their businesses, including data um, analytics and move them down that uh, index, and we've got a job in sparking that and being a catalyst to it. What's next for me? I'm heading over to uh, Austin, um, Texas. To We've lodged a global uh, city um, challenge 
uh, later this month to showcase what we've been doing. I'm also presenting with Gillian um, at the thing, uh, Glasgow Chamber uh, when the shift hits the fan, again to, to talk about what we're doing. Um, but a couple of opportunities, working again with uh, Institute of Future Cities to put an application in for digging into data around tourism. This is a wireless canopy that's going to be potentially put across this area of the city. There may be opportunities to deploy beacons and sensors and look at geofencing and look at how we can enhance the vibrancy of this area. Um, and we're also speaking with National Geographic because they've deemed you know, what Glasgow's doing as a smart city has got some mileage and some uh, editorial um, potential for the travel market. So we're speaking with all the right brands. Um, what we need to do is, I suppose, um, move from doing a lot of talking to a lot of getting stuck into it. And that's really where I would like to come here and, and surround myself with yourselves um, to see what we could potentially do together. Data is all about people and customers, so um, we're a, a very people-centric organisation, so um, to help us prosper, we, we certainly need to work together. Um, and what we want as an organisation, as custodians of that People Make Glasgow brand, we want to turn you guys, um, whether you're su a supplier to us or a collaborator with us, we want to turn you into brand ambassadors, because if we can grow that visitor economy, you guys are all going to benefit. That's me. stands between you and the beer, if you're pleased to hear. Um, so I'll try and keep this short. It won't be technical. It'll be very straightforward. And in keeping with all of my presentations, who's been to one of mine before? Yep, a few. Good. So I start with a plug. Do you remember that? Always plug something. Got to get my money's worth out of this. So um, I don't just do data and recruitment and other bits like that. I also do this thing called film. And we made this little film here. Do you know, we could have made... 35 of these for the cost of this building, just to put it into context, and we've sold this particular one for around about a quarter of this building. So I'll let the statisticians in the room work that out and tell me how good a return on investment that is. But the reason I'm putting that up there is to get the cheap plug in now. It comes out on the 8th of June in Australia, if you're in Australia. You can see it in September in the UK if you want to buy it. You can get it from uh, Amazon sometime around about December this year. So please do go out and buy it, and uh, if you don't, I'll haunt you forever. <laughs> okay, so what I want to talk about is this subject here, which is data as a disruptive force. Now, I've heard some interesting things tonight. Um, Daniel, wherever you are, you've sat down again. I can't see you. Great, great, great presentation. Love the stuff about the people side of it. I'm going to focus on some of that myself. I think it's quite key that that's not forgotten particularly the customer side of things. Uh, but I'm also going to talk about why disruption can't happen with data alone, technology alone, or even with what people think might be one of the key drivers behind it, that imperative to do something different to something that everybody else is doing. So, let's see if I can get this thing to work now. Have you got this? Yeah. You're all going to buy it? Yep, good. Okay, so Jeff gives us quite a lot of quotes. We talked earlier, the first speaker talked about the fact that we see all of these quotes from Apple et al. Well, actually, I quite like this one. Um, this essentially is giving us that horrible warning message that says you can't stand still. And I think there's something in this. Even if you're low risk, even if you're not really a, an innovator in your own right, even if you don't work for the most 
innovative organisation. And I suspect there are many people in the room that would probably put a local authority on that, that, uh, that particular list, and yet we've seen tonight that they're not. That's good. You know, one might argue they've got a little bit more cash to do some of this, but, you know, hey-ho, blaze that trail. So we look at what, what it actually means then. So to innovate, to disrupt, to challenge, to do something different, all of the guys you've heard earlier this evening, Uber, Airbnb, Alibaba, Society One, Netflix, Apple and Google, they've all done something ever so slightly different. They've changed the game. They've broken the rules. They've done something where they've gone out and had a conversation with the people who are consuming the service they wish to provide. Now, the lowest common denominator in all of this, which is not so obvious when you talk to these organizations because they push it to the back of the organization, they push it into the dark room, they push it into that wonderful thing that we might have referred to as a data warehouse a few years ago. It's the data. It's the fact that they can't do it without data. But that's all fair and good. And I would argue that the data they've got would be tremendously rich to all of the data scientists in the room. How many are in the room, by the way? How many data scientists have we got? Okay, so maybe one of you can tell me statistically how many that is, but I suspect it's about 2%. Not many. The issue is having the right number, capable, competent, engaged data scientists to make the most of the data. The issue is about having conversations within the business, between the business users, the data scientists, and the people who harbor that data, to really sweat it and to build plans and to test and build hypotheses around where you can go next with the business. Let's just pick a quick straw poll. Who's used Uber recently in, in Glasgow? Yeah, okay. Who's used Uber in San Francisco? Different? Yeah. Yeah. Because they're peculiar and unique to each of the territories in which they're in, and they operate under local circumstances, local regulation, local legislation, all of that. Great. It's fine. Where are they going next, do you think, with what they're doing? Do you want to hazard a guess? I won't say I'll probably... So you know. <laughs> Where... I'm not allowed to talk about it. Do you want me to tell you what they told me? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So where they're going next is they're starting to sweat the data. They're starting to build those collaborative relationships with other people to be able to trade and make income off the back of the data they have. I'm not going to go much further than that, but that is essentially where they're going. Right, good. Now, that's good for people like Glasgow City Council. It's good for others. It's good for people planning services. But actually, some of the data they're collecting or planning to collect, and I'm not giving anything away here. I know this is in the public domain, but you can kick me if you don't think it is. Some of the data starts to get quite interesting and you know, they're starting to collect telematics data about things like road surfaces, things like distances, things like pollution. And all of that has a wonderful benefit to other people somewhere in this game. Now, if Uber are doing that, surely that's even more disruptive than they've been previously. I'd hope you say yes to that. Yeah, good. But that's the tip of the iceberg because all of these guys are trying to do something like that. They're all trying to move themselves forward. And they're doing it by having conversations with users and new communities of users. So what I want to get to on this is, is really what are the rules, if you like, the common rule set for doing some of this? Well, remember where the term disruptive innovation came from. Um, we had this um, wonderful thesis that came out some time ago now, 2006, 2007, published again in 2008, and then um, hammered home for everybody who read the book um, ever since, but Innovation, Innovator's Dilemma is the book, by the way, if you haven't read it. It's a particularly good read, although some of it is feeling a little bit edgy, a little bit dated. You might want to think about looking at some of the more up-to-date versions of this, which are being published by people like Uber, Airbnb, et al. But what this says is, actually, this is about the thought process you put in up front, not necessarily through the life of that particular business. And I disagree with that. I think actually there's a, a simple set of rules in here that most businesses are still trying to wake up to. Things that people haven't really started to engage. The ability not to bury your head in the sand. The ability to actually think about the challenges you face and meet them head on. And then start to think about what it might mean if you're not around in the next few years. Because somebody has come in and pulled the rug from under you. Because we're seeing a lot of that. And we're going to see more of it. Uh, it's one of those things you kind of have to get over it. The only way you can challenge that yourself is to start thinking outside of the box, start thinking about whether you've got answers to 
unanswered questions, whether you've got data which actually sets a premise for a new service or a new method of engaging a consumer or a customer, somebody who has money that they will quite happily exchange for a quality service. Ultimately, if you look at the number of businesses that are genuinely doing this, it's quite low. If you look at the number of individuals within businesses doing this, it's quite high. This match between management is within the business. So the messages aren't necessarily getting bottom to top, top to bottom. So again, we've got some ideas, some potentials, some areas where this might actually help you think a bit more about this. Um, I, I'm trying to remember the slide that Daniel put up earlier. You've moved, Daniel. You've got back to the beers. Right, I can just about see you again. Thank you. Um, I think there's a question in there about where, about your, uh, your client base. You put a slide up towards the end about people coming to Glasgow. I think one of the missing questions on there is, how do we get more people to come to Glasgow? How do we actually encourage people who want to go somewhere else, maybe Liverpool, and get them to come here instead? And if there's a prospect of doing that, what data do we know, do we need to know that's going to actually give us that insight as to whether somebody can be spun from one part of the country to another? And then what's the promise? What's the gift? What's the exchange that we need to put in place to get that person to come here? Thinking about some of these other areas. Look at this point up here. Look about, do, does it enable product or service innovation? Who thinks service innovation is important if you want to disrupt? Yeah, I think it's a cornerstone. I personally think it's a cornerstone. I know not everybody agrees because people have seen people plod along with regular services. If you looked at version one of Netflix, it, was, it worked, it was good. It gave you a catalogue of films, but it wasn't the easiest thing to use. But actually, they were innovating in the sense they gave you access to things that, frankly, you couldn't, just, you couldn't put in your house in terms of VHS cassettes, DVDs, or Blu-rays. And therefore, it was all about quantum at that point. Now, it's about that bespoke content, as Gillian said earlier. The fact that I might now have access to something bespoke and peculiar to what I like about House of Cards, which, coming from that particular industry, is normally the end credits. Let's pick the bottom two here. I quite like these. So they've got this point here. What partners will get you there quickly? Who thinks you can do disruption without collaboration? Anyone? Good. Oh, I'm so glad. I had an argument with somebody once over this, and it was just quite a terrible argument. I genuinely believe you've got to collaborate. Some of that collaboration is with your supply chain. Some of that collaboration is with non-usual suspects, people you may never have spoken to before. I wholly suspect that if Uber are presenting telematic data, they're having a whole series of brand new conversations about how the sensors work for that, how the IoT link through works, how smart cities might plug into that, how people might take some of that data for the benefit of Uber, and how some might take it for a financial exchange. And all of that means new conversations, and some of those will be gifted and free, and some of those will be for a cost. That's good. That's good. But what about this, this point at the bottom here? How many people are talking to their workforce about this? How many people have had that water cooler moment? Sorry, I can't think of an English version of that, or even the Scottish version. But how many people have had that water cooler moment where they've heard somebody talk about something, yeah, that's, that's brilliant. But it never bubbles up to that top team. It's back to this disconnect. How do you get that idea up there? Now, earlier on, I was having a conversation with someone who I can't remember who it was now, but it was about um, corporate innovation. Actually, I think we were having that conversation earlier. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Mark. So the, you look at innovation in any business, and the problem with innovation in a lot of businesses is it seemed to be within the domain of the leadership, not necessarily something which potentially can be driven by or potentially even helmed by people at different tiers or different levels within the organization. I always remember going through this process of finding bright graduates to come in who scared the living daylights out of me because they knew exponentially more than I did. And it was this concept of hiring crazy people, not crazy because they were running around with their pants on their head, some of them did, crazy because they were not me, and crazy because they didn't think the way I did and crazy because they would present ideas in a very, very fearless way. 
have you thought about this? No, because that's bonkers. Three out of ten weren't that bonkers. And two or three out of ten gave rise to things like Airbnb and others. So I think the workforce and workforce being ready for disruption is key. The question that really ought to be asked as a result of that is, is management ready for disruption? Okay. So that brings me on to this point about the workforce. Let's go back to what we've got. Um, in any organization, you get people at the low end over here in terms of users and business um, operators within the business who are used and abused by what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. I've got this box. They call it a computer. I type this data in. It goes in. I don't really know what happens next. I think someone in finance might use it, or maybe someone else somewhere else might use it. I, I, I'm not really sure. Then at the other end of the scale, we've got these. They're zeros. These are fives. I'm a user chooser. I've read all the books. I can tell you what gives. I reckon I could come up with my own model for this, and I reckon I could add a bit of value to what I do for me, at the same time as adding a bit of value to the organization. Of course, the problem with that is if you try to wrangle both ends of that organization, it's just going to get messy. So how do you start to make the most of the fact that you've got people at this end of the scale here totally disengaged, all the way through to people who, frankly, anyone under the age of probably... Oh, I've got to pick the right age now. That's terrible, isn't it? Okay, I'm old. I, we all know that. So I can confidently say that it's probably going to be younger than me, which is good. I would say probably anyone under the age of 25 is automatically a digital native. Is that fair? Yeah? If you're 26, I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> digital immigrants, people who have taken a passport out and entered the space. They're making the most of it. They get it. They're kind of maybe early adopters, a bit tech geeky. Listen, I've got a bag behind here that's full of wires. I'm probably just about pushing up to that space. I don't know what they all do, but I've got a bag full of wires. Uh, digital voyeurs, typically people who in the past have employed me. They like to sit on the sideline and have a look. Every now and again, it gets slightly rude and messy. And they try to make the most of it. Don't always pay for it. Hey ho. The digital holdouts over here. Oh look, these are these are my favourites. We used to call these laggards in the old IT maturity cycle. I'm not adopting that. No, not using that either. What? You've got a mainframe for sale? Not not for me. Not even if you're IBM. Sorry, Gillian. But how do you manage this whole environment? The answer, I believe, is to give them the gift of being able to communicate, talk, educate, socialize, and work with each other, to share ideas, to collaborate, to have this open, wallless, barrierless environment in which people can say things without fear of failure. Because actually, there's nothing wrong with failing every now and again if you fail quickly and get over it and learn. And therefore, this is about now saying, I want a workforce that comprises this lot. Because actually, some of the guys this end help me de-risk the decisions I may be making, because they're going to give me quite a sensitive read as to how this might land with I think it's any easier. I'm not suggesting it's any easier to do that. I don't think it's easy, but actually I think this is probably easier than coming up with a new Uber. Hopefully. Okay, so if you want to disrupt, there are some basic good practice ideas. This is based on my experience of working with clients. Um, I'm not going to go through these in detail because I'm conscious that I really do stand between you and beer. Happy to talk about these later. The slides will be available. Start slow. Don't rush. There is no rush. You rush, you're more likely to trip, and the trip hazards that sit in the mask, like I think as I read on the phone whilst I was waiting to talk, BHFs, which I think has finally gone under. Um, <laughs> Think about the process that is being disrupted as well as products that are being disrupted. Part of the issue is a lot of people think, okay, this is a new product, it's shiny, it does something different, ever so slightly different, and actually people will want it. We can't deliver it because we haven't got a workflow to support it and we actually don't know how to um, wrap a service around this. Now, that was part of the problem in the early days of things like Netflix and some of the Amazon Prime streaming services because they would struggle to get that content out there. Who's got an Amazon Fire Stick or Box? Right, less than 1%. But that's good, isn't it? Good? Yep. High quality, get the content, it works, it does what it says it does on the tin. Yeah, 
Now, without that, you were dependent on having a smart TV. And the funny thing is, is who's had a, who's had a brand new TV since 20, uh, 2008? Yeah, good. You've all got smart TVs. You probably just don't know it. That, that, it's that colourful button in the middle of the remote control, as I discovered by accident, then spent three hours trying to get back out of that menu. Um, but actually, this is about thinking about the whole thing, soup to nuts, end to end, disrupting process, disrupting teams, disrupting competition, disrupting the marketplace, and disrupting products. Let's come down to the bottom one here, partnering again. I don't want to underestimate the importance of this. Um, engage the team, fire them up, support them, provide them with an opportunity to innovate. Remember, fail fast. Failure is not the enemy. Failure is the ally of disruptive innovation. If you think we're getting away from data, we're coming back to it in a minute. So collaborate. We talked about that. Collaborate re collaboration requires communication. Communication requires trust. Trust we talked about earlier. If you think about your client base, if you want to go and collaborate with your clients, one of the biggest challenges you've got is you've got to be able to exemplify trust, privacy, and security. Who trusts the banks? <laughs> oh, you'd be really brave to put a hand up right now, wouldn't you? Who works for a bank? That's not fair. I need at least one person who works for a bank because there were no hands for who trusts one. Thank you. Um, but this is the point here about if you want to have those trusted relationships, the banks would dearly love to innovate and get out there and do something different. We've got a disruptor in this country, Metro Bank. They did it by coming in and talking to the public. What don't you like about your current bank service? What is it that peeves you about it? What is it that makes you think, Do you know, I really want to change, but I can't be bothered? And as a result, they started to package new offerings by walking that customer journey the way the customer articulated it, not the way the bank would have articulated it. OK. So get the data right. This was our theme in Aberdeen, getting the data right. In our experience in the surveys that we perform at MBM, one of the issues and challenges we often see is that there are fantastically rich, massive data lakes, data sets, data warehouses, and there's a square root of bugger all decent data in it. Quite often because it hasn't been managed, the governance is poor, stewardship isn't there, and the top team don't really know what it's all about, so they're not really investing in that area. It is incumbent on data professionals to raise the awareness within the business and go back to management and engage with them and tell them what the mistake is they're making as a result of ignoring what sits at their feet. Remember what I said at the start, data isn't the answer for, disruptive, for disruption. It is part of the disruption process. It's the people wrapped around the data, wrapped around a proposition, which is built on the premise of what the customer is genuinely looking for. Um, in terms of this, I'm going to pick this last point here, cast the net wide. In terms of data, too many of us get hung up on what we've currently got stored in our legacy systems in the data warehouse, and we forget some of the ancillary data we've got access to. I found it quite interesting talking to one of the Midlands local authorities about some of their Visit Britain information that they had, that they hadn't touched or accessed in eight years. Eight years. What do you reckon, Daniel? bit negligent, isn't it, really? Yeah, poor, negligent. It's, it's basically abusing the fact they've got access to it, and they're just not doing nothing with it. But actually, the reason for that was because all of their data was presented in the format that allowed them to work it through SPSS, and nobody had an SPSS license. Go figure. OK, so just trying to bring this up now to the final point on here, which is basically that I think whatever happens, board management and staff ignorance can no longer be held as a defense. Um, ignorance is not a defense. Ignorance equals negligence. And if you are a shareholder in a business, a stakeholder in a business, a customer, a client of a business, you should feel duty bound to go and beat people around the head with the data set and say, get it sorted. I want to see new offerings, new ways of doing business, new ways of engaging me, new ways of supporting me. And I want you to be leading this way because I'm a loyal customer of yours and I, I want you to be sustainable. So there are a few points on here. I'm definitely not going to read all of this, but it essentially summarizes the fact that data can be disruptive. It, if you've got analytics as a cornerstone of your business, you've got a better prospect of it. But actually, you need the right people. You need collaboration. You need working across the different silos, data, IT, marketing, finance. And if you don't have that cross-fertilized work, and if you are 
fiefdoms or silos, it's unlikely to deliver. And then ultimately, make sure that you go through cycles of looking at what data you have, what you need, and where you might get the rest of the picture from will give rise to opportunities. And just to finish off, if you didn't get it at the start, and I know I went back over the slide a few times, <laughs> we've won 28 awards. We think that's quite good for a cheap film. Thanks very much. So that's it. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the first data science meetup here in Glasgow. Um, if you would like to volunteer to speak at a future event, if you would like to volunteer the person sitting next to you, that's good too. Um, if you would like to hear some future topics, then let us know. We'll find the speakers. Thank you for everyone that's joining remotely to the live stream that couldn't be here. We are delighted you're part of our community. Go and network, enjoy a few more drinks. And for those, Simon and the team are available for a tour of the building. But finally, I'd like to thank the Taunt team for hosting us tonight and our speakers this evening. And thank you very much for coming along. Thank you.